Welcome back to our video module on dynamics. Today I'd like to pose a slightly different question regarding the cart that we looked at in our previous video module. So we still have our cart coming towards the wall and the cart's still going to compress as it hits the wall. However, I'm going to change the question. I'm going to ask, what is the maximum compression that the cart experiences? What is the maximum compression? Today, I'd like to look at two approaches that we can take to this problem and try to understand the difference between the two. The first strategy we can take is that of using our equations of motion to identify position, velocity, and acceleration. In order to do so, I'll tell you that the force that the cart experiences is kx. So as the position increases, so does the force and we can combine this with our equation of motions to get the solution. If you want to see if you can do this on your own, go ahead and put the video on pause, give it a go. I'll show you what the solution is in just a couple seconds. So welcome back. If you tried it on your own, hopefully you came up with this solution here where the maximum position was the square root of m over k times v naught. And you can see that what we've done is we set up our differential equation we assumed a solution of a sine omega t, a sinusoidal function. Then we used our initial conditions to identify what the uh, coefficients were here. And then I took a shortcut here where I realized that this value is going at its maximum is going to be one, which would leave the maximum position, the maximum compression, square root of m over k v naught. In fact, if I wanted, if I hadn't taken this shortcut, I'd also have to find the velocity and then I'd have to solve for when the time when the velocity went to zero and then plug that time back in here. I'm going to think about this for a minute. I know that all the kinetic energy, it has moved to spring potential energy. So potential of the spring. So that means my kinetic energy is now equal to my spring potential energy. I know my kinetic energy is one half mv squared, and that's v naught squared, and now it's all converted to spring potential energy. So I have one half kx squared. So let's go ahead and solve for x and find out what we have. We have x squared equals m v naught squared over k. Take the square root of both sides. We have m over k v naught equals x. Comparing these two solutions, our results are the same, but the calculation that was done here is trivial compared to the calculation done over here. Let's think about this and see what that tells us. Now over on the left, when we solve for position, velocity, and acceleration, even if we didn't finish off the calculations, we're able to look at each of those values throughout the experience. So if you want half the accelerations or half the velocities gone and you want to know how much spring energy there is, you can find that. This gives us all the information for everything we need. Using the energy, on the other hand, only looks at time A and time B. It's as if we're taking a snapshot and we want to know, all right, we have some kinetic energy. How has that been converted to potential energy at this time? It's great for looking at the state of the system at one point and comparing it with the state of the system at another. Different problems you're going to get are going to require one or the other. The beauty of energy is it gives us another tool in our toolbox that we can bring out when the problem or the project demands it. Now some of you may be asking, well, why does this work? How, how does all this work? Well, without going into too much detail, both your equations of motion and your energy, they're all functions of position, velocity, and mass. So this allows them to model the real world. Soon enough, we're going to have systems where it doesn't look like there's conservation of energy. In other words, we have a bunch of kinetic energy, something happens, and then we have less kinetic energy, and we've actually it appears lost energy. However, I want to be clear that there's always conservation of energy. Now, it may be that that energy has gone into unproductive forms of energy, such as heat 
or uh, motion, right, which are basically the same thing. So we always have conservation of energy. However, in our problems, we may not be able to measure that that energy that goes to heat. And so in that case, we say kind of tongue in cheek, oh, energy was not conserved, even though we know it is. I hope that gives you a good feel of how we can use energy to solve problems, how it can be another tool in our toolbox. I look forward to seeing you in our next video module as we take a look at it even a little bit more closely.